Hello and welcome to News Click. On 4 December, Indian Army soldiers shot dead 13 civilians, minors who were simply returning from work in the Mon district of Nagaland. The Indian government has called it a case of misidentification and intelligence inputs gone wrong. In the violence that ensued, there was further firing by the army, a soldier died and some were injured. The continuance of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act in force since 1958 has come into focus once again. We have with us well-known lawyer and writer, Nandita Haksar, who has extensive experience working in the region to help put the violence in context, explain what is at stake for the region. Uh, Nandita Haksar, welcome to the show. Nandita, I wanted to begin by asking whether you can put this recent incident of violence in some sort of framework. Is it a question of intelligence failure gone wrong or is it a question of impunity of the army? I think it's something much, much more serious in the sense that, okay, maybe they, you know, they have a, the, you know, they have imp the intelligence has some information. Maybe they take an ambush position and they have been doing it from 58. But what kind of failure is it that coal miners are coming and they don't know how to stop it and they just start firing? It's not an inexperienced force which has been in that area. I understand mistakes can happen, but it, in, a, in this situation where they have been doing counterinsurgency, where Armed Forces Special Powers Act has been used since 1958, how on earth can this be a mistake? These are people who have been experienced in counterinsurgency and in mountain warfare. They are trained. And yet, this horrendous act could have been done. It shows an utter indifference to human lives, an utter indifference to you know uh, what they can get away with because they cannot get away with something like this in any other part. So they have that assurance within themselves that, okay, this is just one more incident. But this time, it's not one more incident. I think the Nagas, there's now a long history, there's meant to be a peace process, and I think this time their patience has run out. And the kind of protests and demonstrations that we have seen this time is truly different from all the parts. Do you think? Do you think the northeast uh, parts of the northeast will become ungovernable, as the Indian government says, if the law is withdrawn? We, meaning the human rights community and all those who have been fighting against this particular act, are saying a very simple thing: if there's an insurgency, if there's a political problem, however complex and difficult, the only solution is a political solution. Military solution does not work, has not worked. Our history shows it has not worked. In 1958, there was one Naga insurgent group led by Mr. Pizzo, the NNC, Naga National Council. Today, you have 11 groups. Partly, these groups reflect the policy of intelligence agencies to divide and rule. So, therefore, they thought that by dividing and ruling and, and multiplying these groups, you could stop insurgency. Now the situation from 58 to now is far more complex and in my opinion, far more dangerous for the unity and security of, the, of India and for the region, I mean region of South Asia. That the broader context of the talks between the different rebel groups and the Indian government has some kind of a role over here? Well, I think that there is no framework for peace talks. These talks have begun on different, uh, on, with different terms and conditions with different groups. Depending on the group's own uh, political power and ability to negotiate. There is no transparency, there is no accountability in any of the peace processes. So there is, a uh, peace process is more or less a effort or a part of the counterinsurgency. It's not a part of political solution to very serious problems of Indian democracy and Indian nation building. 
So the context right now is of the Hornbill Festival. Have you ever attended this festival and uh, what kind of a projection of uh, Naga culture does it do? Is it a very textbookish version? No, no. In fact, it's a very politically uh, volatile idea. The Hornbill Festival is uh, projected as a festival of Naga land, not of all Nagas. Yes, I have been to the Hornbill Festival. And yes, I was shocked that some of the Naga tribe dances, when the troop came to the Nagaland festival, they were described as tribals from Manipur and not as Nagas. Therefore, I, and it is celebrated on December 1, which is the day of Nagaland state. And Nagaland state, according to many Naga scholars, was a creation for counterinsurgency and dividing Naga people between Nagas of Nagaland and Nagas of the other parts of India, which is Manipur, Assam, Arunachal. So the whole approach to the Naga problem has been one of trying to settle it through counterinsurgency methods, which is like divide and rule, misinformation, and such tactics. So we, we're also noticing that it's not just a recent incident, but there was a uh, rather unprecedented uh, border skirmish between Mizoram and Assam. We have uh, refugees coming in into Mizoram uh, from uh, Myanmar. And we have groups which have different positions on drawing the outlines of uh, what constitutes Nagalim. Uh, can you just put all of this in context? First of all, is uh, the Northeast region as a whole becoming uh, more volatile than it than it was a few years ago. So to that question that you've asked, there are many questions, and maybe what we really ought to do is to spell out what is the northeast area. Sometimes we forget that the northeast area is joined to India by a border of 22 kilometers. That's it. In what is called the Siliguri corridor, the rest 98 percent of northeast India the northeast region of India is linked by international borders. All these international borders are volatile. All these international borders are uh, with countries where there are ethnic, religious, racial, national, all kinds of uh, you know conflicts. Plus, there are international intelligence agencies. So, in that kind of context, it is utmost important that the citizens of India living within the Indian borders should feel a sense of belonging. And if they do not feel a sense of belonging and they feel alienated, they can be manipulated by various groups, by intelligence agencies, by other vested interests. And that is happening. So yes, and now at the moment, for instance, the, as you mentioned, Myanmar uh, refugees are coming in. And a lot of them are political refugees, but a lot of them are not political refugees. And there is a volatile situation in which some refugees who are actually migrants are competing for land uh, with certain communities which are living on the border. So there is a very, very complex dynamics going on, which is not understood by ordinary people or like you and me in its, in its so the civil society does not intervene in the way it should and it's left to the government to somehow deal with this problem and each government i'm not saying only this government because this problem is not begun with this government but this government has complicated the matter with its own understanding and, and so it, what is the complication that this government in particular creates? So what it is doing is, it is trying to have an alliance of Buddhists. It is promoting Buddhism as, an, as a means of cementing or creating a unity. And this is an area which is not necessarily Buddhist uh, majority area. So there is a policy of using Buddhism uh, as a tool, its weaponization of Buddhism against what they think is the main uh, threat to India, which is Islam or militant Islam or political Islam. 
So you have this kind of situation on a border. So do you think that there are actually intimations of a certain restlessness that were not there just a few years ago? We have Assam also in turmoil uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And then but you have now, this... So we have these tensions already. Some of it was being sorted out by some kinds of peace talks. But now we have a, a series of BJP governments which openly pro are promoting an idea of Hindu identity. You have a large Muslim population, some of it may be migrants, who have been, who have seen no possibility because of the changes in the uh, Citizens Act of becoming citizens, which right. itself provides a very volatile situation. You have uh, Rohingyas who are coming in as refugees not getting refugee status left again to the hands and very vulnerable to certain Muslim uh, militant groups. So the question is, how do we solve this problem? Can we solve it by uh, a majoritarian authoritarian method? Do we solve it by ethnic democracy? Do we solve it by a democratic structure? Do we solve it by law? Or do we solve it by military solution. What is actually the, the important thing here is that these settlement discussions have also been going on in Nagaland for quite some time now, uh, 1975, 2015. What are really the roadblocks which are preventing this from really coming to fruition? Well, Naga peace talks is a far more complex issue which has been going on from 97 to now. And we thought that maybe it will be settled in 2013, I think, when they had that August 3rd uh, agreement. But we see, again, a hardening of, of um, attitudes. And uh, again, a total lack of vision. Nagaland movement has now more and more identified itself with a religious identity. It's less a national identity and more a religious identity. Now, for instance, everywhere it is the religious identities which are asserting itself. So now it is a overall, um, it is Nagaland for Christ. And it's Nagaland for a particular type of uh, Christianity, which is fundamentalist, which is a kind of, uh, and, and therefore, you, through these processes, it's more and more a uh, religious ethnic identity and not a political, civil, national uh, self-determination. So yes, it has complicated the matter. Nandita, one very interesting thing is this demand for a separate constitution or a demand for a separate flag, for your own flag. Uh, why does it raise heckles and uh, where does the demand come from? Can you really explain uh, this often confuses a lot of people? Well, if you look at it, if a people are asking for independence and sovereignty, then flag and a constitution are normally the symbol. Perhaps, I do not know because I have not been involved in the latest round of talks. Uh, right. When I was involved, there was a talk of ish other issues like land issue, mineral issue. But today, maybe, I do not know, uh, they thought of, the, of Kashmir, which has its own constitution and it has its own flag. But in, I don't think it's such a sensitive issue because every state has its own flag. And right. in India, every state seems to have its own national song. Mizoram has a national song, Assam has a national song, and uh, they call it national song. They don't call it national anthem. But right. it's more or less like their, their national song. And I think the beauty of this country was that you could have a national song, you could have yours, but we were all Indian. But today, right. the idea of India, in whatever way we define it, has taken a beating. I don't think people talk about the idea of India, except a few of us who were left from another generation. So it is, it is that which is very dangerous if we want a united India. December 31st is uh, uh, another date um, which, uh, you know, for the AFSPA to come up uh, for ending. Um, do you think the government is going to veer around at some point uh, to, to, to withdraw the law? 
at least from Nagaland. I don't actually know why people think that they could withdraw it. Because to me, even if they withdraw it, let's see, even if they withdraw it, it's not one law. The same kind of authoritarian, they may arrest you one day under TADA, then they have another law, POTA, they may have UPA, now they have tax rates, and they have rates like on, in Newsweek. So they can, it's not a law which is the reason for anything. It is a growing authoritarianism in this country. And actually, it's not only in this country. It is all over, all over the world, we see this. And we see that COVID or the pandemic has been used to pass very stringent laws. Aung San Suu Kyi has been given four years for violating COVID law. Right. So it, it's not a question of Armed Forces Special Powers Act. I think it's much more, much more serious because today the language of human rights has been weaponized. The language of human rights is used to justify war from Yugoslavia to Afghanistan to Iraq. So when in international community, when there is a weaponization of human rights, then what language, with which language do we fight against this? And that right. is a much more serious problem than merely one act, because it is the culture of Armed Forces Special Powers Act, the political culture which has been used for creating immunity, for allowing the Armed Forces to do whatever they have been doing, this type of counterinsurgency which uh, which uh, has allowed murder, rapes, theft, looting to take place. We filed a case in 19, 1887. For 27 years, the Indian courts didn't give a judgment. When they gave it, it was they didn't give any justice. Now we've come to a point when even human rights movement has totally weakened. And human rights discourse, as I said, has been weaponized. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, uh, Manita, very much. Thanks very much for watching. Subscribe to NewsClick YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram.